hear these whispers from the lips of Queen Egged God. Want to know the story of Queen Mara Sov and the Awoken people? How did they come to be? Is Mara a god? I'm going to be reading lore from the Book of Marasana, which explains majorly from Mara's point of view how the Awoken people came to be. If you like what you hear, please drop a like on the video and subscribe to find out when I drop new content on YouTube. You can also find me Monday through Friday live on Mixer. All right, let's read some lore. Secrets. Do you come in hope, O oh reader, for the secrets of my reign? A parable in the nitrate earth of the lightning crater, where the firmament has joined an electric fury with the fundament. There lives a burrowing insect with two trembling antenna, then his whiskers long as life. A grasping hand reaches for buried secrets, finds the antenna, and then pulls. Comes away with a single whisker, meaningless. The searcher disappointed. A wounded insect buried deeper, the secret now half blind. That which digs for truth may bury deeper lies. If you recognize my authority, then I command you to pass onward as gently as the lover passes a razor over beloved skin. If you do not, then I name you Magiscept, doubter of royalty, and I suggest you watch your edge. Cut too deep and too quickly, and you will kill the thing you want to know. Think too eagerly, and as the digging hand leaves its print in soft earth, so you will find only the image left by your own presumptions. Beware the one who feeds on truth adjacent lies. Beware the space between reality as imagined and reality as is, for it is abundant to those with appetite. So then, the brave voyager's fate, the timeless birthing place, my Milton reenactment, the ruins made ours, the riven twice riven, the daughter's blood scabbed hard on her mother's wound. All things told, all truth revealed, if through mist and misery. If you have grace, then see our sorrows, but swallow back your tears. We were made to pay this price. I led us to our fate. The woman sits on a ledge that overhangs infinity. She looks down and kicks her legs. The stars shine brilliant here, because the sun is only fractionally brighter than the rest of them. Sol lies almost perfectly below her. Of course, up and down are defined only by the thrust axis of Yang and Lue. Upward, the black umbrella of the shield and the matter storage, and the dock ships which make Yang Lue not just a mother ship, but an entire traveling fleet. Down below, along the slim spine of the ship, the shielded bulb of the engine glows invisibly infrared. If she slips off this ledge, she will fall down the ship's length at one third of an Earth gravity, not because there's anything pulling her, but because the ship is pulling away. Yang Lue is accelerating, slowly, but inexorably towards the stars. She is of no single race or ancestry, and the light on her skin is the color of starlight. She drifts with her suit tinted clear so she can soak it up. She was 19 years and 9 months old at the moment the ship began its transstellar injection burn. Although this is only true if you count by the calendar of a planet she has barely visited but will always love. She thinks you cannot help but love Earth if you grew up in space. You love Earth the way all adolescents secretly adore two century old video of Nai Nai and Yi Yi dancing on New Year's Eve. Earth does not ask too much. The colonies are demanding parents, but Earth is like a chill old grandma simmering in weird art and weirder ideas, enthroned upon ecology older than human time. Earth was the first terraformed world. Life made Earth livable. She is going with Yang Lue and the rest of Project Amrita to make new worlds. She came because she saw an omen in a man's death. She was on EVA with him repairing a jammed radiator fin on an uncrewed circumjovian platform they worked in companionable silence listening to the howl of the jovian magnosphere when it happened a frozen rabbit embryo came out of deep space at 40 kilometers per second and went through a spaceplate the rabbit must have been spilled in a biocontainer accident far from the sun to plunge back inward like a comet 
Immediately afterwards, for reasons very clear to her, because she has always had a sense for the meaning of things, reasons very difficult to explain to others because she has always felt the sense was a secret. She asked her mother if the family could travel with Project Amrita. Amrita, the drink that endeth drinking, the bottomless cup. It is the quest to spread far beyond the solar system and to end human dependence on the traveler. It calls to those who see humanity as a cocoon, an instar, a form ready to be shed. She's an otteridge, third class, self-motivating subsystem of the ship's inclusive ecology, a term that spans technology, biology, and behavior, all of which must be maintained for the mission to succeed. Her task is to locate problems and report them to an otteridge second class who will give her the tools she needs to repair them. But she never speaks to her second. She never tells anyone about the problems she finds. Instead, she fixes them herself. Her work has therefore assumed a magical quality. She appears where there's trouble, and shortly afterward, the trouble goes away. People have begun to leave gifts for her. Some of these gifts are questions. She answers the questions with a quiet confidence. Some would argue she has not earned. She knows she sees more of their lives than they see of hers. And that this mystery, this seeing without being seen, grants her a kind of power that is like wisdom. She lives outside the ship, suited and cocooned in a layer of citadel, which keeps her surgically clean. She misses the wild zero gravity fashions of her upbringing. Clothes like drifting jellyfish that squirm away from snags. Self-correcting darts in the fabric. Silk like cool spilled alcohol. She misses the sense of oil and sweat on her skin, for the suit leaves her so clean that she feels skinned raw. Still, she stays out here because she wants to feel the changing taste of starlight as the universe ahead blue shifts. As Yang Lue accelerates toward light speed, it moves faster and faster into the light coming from ahead. If light were like dust, it would strike Yang faster, but light can never change speed, so, it gains energy instead. Red light is low energy, and blue light is a high energy. So the universe becomes blue. Even now, the very tip of the visual spectrum, violet blue is shifting up into the invisible ultraviolet. The color of speed, the color of future. And subscribe to drop. <laughs> drop it like it's hot. <laughs> do that, yeah, yeah, do that. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this Destiny 2 lore reading, The Book of Marisama. Part two will be out in a few days. Subscribe for notifications. If you like the content and want to hear more, let me know. I'm Feffinator, and you can catch me Monday through Friday live on Mixer.